Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about Bayesian posterior model probabilities. It's the second video in a three-part series talking about how to do these calculations. In the first video, we dealt with situations where we had an alternative hypothesis that was one-sided. So we had something like a null hypothesis saying that the parameter is less than or equal to a value, and the alternative saying that it's greater than that value. I'll put a link up here to that previous video because you might want to think about that before you get into the more general situation that we're going to talk about now. As usual, down below, there's a PDF version of these slides. So, uh, if we're thinking about calculating from a Bayesian perspective, when we think about doing hypothesis testing, those hypotheses are really just models for data. Right? Uh, I had a whole video on that before. Maybe there'll be a link up here. Otherwise, you can search for statistical hypotheses. So because statistical hypotheses are just models, oftentimes from a Bayesian perspective, instead of talking about hypotheses, we talk about models. And now, previously, we've always had just two hypotheses. We've had it in a null and an alternative hypothesis, but there's no reason from a Bayesian perspective, number one, to treat either of those hypotheses differently. And number two, to limit it to two hypotheses. So what the formulation we're going to talk about right now is not limited to the number of models. You see right away, I write up here for J models, so we can have an arbitrary number of those models. Um, and there's no special treatment for one hypothesis versus another. All treated exactly the same. All right, what we're going to do as a Bayesian is to calculate something called a posterior model probability. The posterior model probability is just this. Right? Remember that as a Bayesian, what we always do is we calculate the distribution of the things we don't know on the left side of the condition bar, given the things that we know on the right side. In this case, what we know are the data that we've observed, and what we don't know are which models are true. Now, for this uh, notation, it's a little bit different than notation we've used before. This probability, or this statement right here, is actually a probability. Right? So in the end, what we're going to get is a collection of probabilities over all of our models. There's going to be J models. This PMJ is going to the probability for model J, given the data. That's going to be a statement about our belief about that model being true, given all the data we've collected. Because that's the case, all of these posterior model probabilities have to sum to one. All right, so now how are we going to calculate this posterior model probability? Well, we're going to do it using Bayes' rule. Right? So Bayes' rule allows us to swap the conditioning. So according to Bayes' rule, this probability is just PY given MJ times PMJ divided by PY. Right? That's implementing Bayes' rule. All right, so now what are these different terms? This PY given MJ is just the prior predictive density for model J. And we'll talk more about that in a second. The second term, the PMJ, that's your prior belief about the models. That is, it defines what the probability is, your belief, about which model is true before you collected any data. Again, those will need to sum to one, just like the posterior model probabilities need to sum to one. Now in the denominator, we just have PY. Uh, this was previously called the marginal likelihood. It's gonna have a slightly different uh, derivation here. So the way that we're gonna calculate the denominator is to use the total law of total probability, and what we're going to do is we're just going to sum over the numerators for all of the different models, right? And really all this has the effect of doing is to making sure that those posterior model probabilities sum to one. Okay, so, so this is fine. Now we have a bunch of terms here. We've already talked about the prior model probabilities. So in order to do Bayesian posterior model probability calculations, we're going to need a prior over all of our models. And again, these must sum to one. They must be probabilities, that is numbers between zero and one. The other term that we have here is what's called a prior predictive distribution. And we're gonna talk more about that, but the key piece I wanna note right now is that we need, for all of our models, we need a prior over the parameters in those models. So this prior predictive distribution just integrates out those parameters. All right, so let's talk about this prior predictive distribution. This prior predictive distribution, as we had on the previous slide, right, is just the notation here is PY given MJ, and it's just the integral over the parameters in that distribution. 
So just as an example, let's suppose that we have a model for our data that's normal with an unknown mean mu and a variance of one. All right, now we need to define a prior over the parameters. The convenient one to choose is a normal distribution. So we'll choose a normal for that unknown mean. And for simplicity, we'll let the variance be C. Okay. All right, now if we want to uh, integrate out mu, uh, or if you remember the combinations of normals are normal, you can find that the distribution for y after we've integrated out that parameter isn't normal with a mean of zero and a variance of one plus c. All right, so that's how we're gonna get that prior predictive distribution. Now, in this scenario, we are just considering, at least at the moment, two different models. Let's call those models uh, a, null, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So now I'm switching back and forth a little bit in that notation between hypotheses and models. But this is the one that's going to be a little bit more relevant in order to compare to non-Bayesian approaches to hypothesis testing. So if we just have those two hypotheses or those two models, then we can calculate the posterior probability of the null hypothesis or of that null model uh, just using Bayes' rule. And so the denominator now looks like this because we only have two models that we're considering. We can do a little bit of rearrangement of this equation, and we can find that we have, we actually go back, we have two ratios here. First, we have the, uh, the farthest one to the right. We have this pHa divided by pH0. This is called the prior odds in favor of the alternative hypothesis, but we can just calculate that given our prior over models. The second ratio we have there, Py given Ha divided by Py given H0, well, that is just the prior predictive distribution for the alternative divided by the null, right? And that's just going to be a number because what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the value for y. And now that number is given special notation. So this notation right here, bf ha colon h0, that ha colon h0 just tells you which way the ratio goes because you could define this either way. And this quantity right here is called the Bayes factor. And now the importance of the Bayes factor here is that it removes the prior over the models. That is that prior odds fraction that was up there. So this is in some sense a database comparison of models. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Bayes factors from the perspective of interpretation. So Bayes factors can be any number between zero and infinity. And so it's a little bit harder to determine how to interpret that compared to thinking about posterior model probabilities. So if we use the whole formula here with our prior odds, we can calculate the posterior probability for the null hypothesis and the posterior probability for the alternative. And I feel like I understand what probabilities mean and therefore those make sense to me. All right, so let's go back to that normal model and we're going to imagine this scenario where we have a null that says that the mean is zero and alternative that says the mean is not zero. From a Bayesian perspective, we need to make a couple of assumptions first, a prior over the models. Let's keep it simple and make those two equal. We need a prior over the parameter in the alternative because it's not specified. For simplicity, we're going to call that prior over that mean to be a standard normal. So that is a normal with zero mean and a variance of one. And now uh, our prior predictive distributions for our data, well, the null hypothesis defines it right here. It's just a standard normal. But under our alternative, when we integrated out mu, right, if you go back a couple of sides, now C is just one, and therefore we have a normal with a variance of two, okay? All right, so if we want to go and calculate now the Bayes factor and calculate the posterior model probability, here's some R code to do it. For simplicity, uh, we only have a single observation like the model assumes, uh, and that value is 0.3. When the value is 0.3, then the posterior probability of the null is about 0.58 and the posterior probability of the alternative is about 0.42. So what is this really doing, right? This is sort of a visual depiction of what's going on here. So first, the two bell curves, one uh, is associated with the null and one with the alternative. So the red solid line is the prior predictive distribution for that null hypothesis. The bluish dashed curve is the prior predictive distribution under the alternative. And then there's this sort of dashed gray line that goes up from y equals 0.3. That's the observed data, 
and then you can see some big points there on those bell-shaped curves. Those are just evaluating that prior predictive distribution at those two observations, right? And we can see that the null hypothesis, uh, well, the data evaluated under the prior predictive distribution for the null hypothesis is higher than that for the alternative hypothesis. And thus, the data are telling us that it seems more likely that the alternative, sorry, that the null is true with this data. Now, what I really want to get across here is that what we're doing when we're doing a Bayesian model comparison, right, when we're calculating those Bayesian posterior model probabilities, is that we are really comparing two predictive distributions for the data, right? These are the two predictive distributions. And whichever one is higher when we evaluate it for the data that we actually observed, right, that model gets more weight. It has a higher posterior probability. Now, just to make sure that our intuition is there, let's look at a plot of what happens when you change the data. So now what we're doing is everything else is held constant, so our prior for the mean parameter is still a standard normal. Um, everything else is the same, and the only thing we're changing on that x-axis is the value for our observation. Okay, And so what we can see here is that when y is close to 0, then there's a relatively high probability that the null hypothesis is true. That's why we see that peak right there right around zero. As the data gets farther away from zero, there's less support for that null hypothesis, right? And more support that that mean mu is something other than zero, right? And so we can see that the null hypothesis probability goes down, the alternative hypothesis probably goes up. All right, so I hope that provides some intuition over what's going on here. Now, the next thing I want to focus on is the fact that uh, the prior over the parameters actually has a lot of influence on these posterior model probability calculations. So let's go back to our same setup. Uh, sorry, I thought I fixed this. We don't have independent data. We only have a single observation from our normal. Uh, we're going to do the same assumptions, but now we're being uh, possibly more non-informative about our prior mean mu. So we have now have a normal centered at zero still, but a variance of C. Okay, so we can calculate our prior predictive distributions for under the null, just a standard normal, but under the alternative, it's now a normal, the mean zero and a variance of one plus C, rather than one plus one that we had before. All right, we can go through, we can calculate our base factors, right, just like we did before. And then uh, we can take a look at what happens as you change C. So for the moment, looking at this plot, just look at a single line. So let's take out that blue line, right, where y is equal to 4. So this is for a data that happens to be 4. And that blue line tells us the probability that the null hypothesis is true, given that value of y equals 4, and a particular value for c, shown here as the square root of c. All right? And so what we can see here is that, maybe I should say first, under the null hypothesis, a value of 4 is extremely unlikely, right? Under a standard normal, you expect 99.7% of the observations to be plus or minus 3, right? And this value is at 4, so it's extremely unlikely under the null hypothesis. And yet, as you increase that prior variance, right? So as you increase C, what you see is that blue line starts increasing, right? At first, it increases sort of slowly, but later it gets faster and faster, and eventually it's going to get closer and closer and closer and closer to that value of 1. So that is, if C is large enough, then you are almost convinced that the null hypothesis is true, despite the fact that Y equals 4 is an extremely unlikely value under that null hypothesis. And the rest of the lines on this graph just show you that this is true no matter the value for the observation. So no matter what data you've observed, uh, all of these lines trend up as you increase that prior variance. All right, and so the bottom line here is in order to do, in, in, in order to provide meaningful interpretation, the Bayesian posterior model probabilities, you need to have informative priors. Trying to be non-informative, like we're trying to be here with a large value for C, just doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because of that prior predictive distribution, right? So that prior predictive distribution, as, as denoted right here, has the integral over that prior. 
And what happens with this integral as that prior over the parameter, in this case theta, gets more and more diffuse, that is it gets flatter and flatter, is that that integral just decreases in value. So regardless of y, that evaluation of that prior predicted distribution gets smaller and smaller. All right, so really what happens with Bayesian posterior model probabilities is it tells you which of the models, right, among the whole collection of models that you might have, which of them does a better job of predicting the data that you've observed. And in order to do that, you really have to have informative priors uh, over the parameters in your models. This is not a situation where you can be vague and not informative when you're doing Bayesian posterior model probability calculations. All right, the last video in this uh, sequence of three videos is gonna talk about the relationship between p-values and Bayesian posterior probabilities. Hope to catch you there.